This lesson looks further into the trait and social cognitive theories of personality. As you might have expected, trait theories of personality focus on identifying, describing, and measuring individual differences. In contrast, social cognitive theories revolve around the idea that a person's conscious thought processes in different situations strongly influence his or her actions. Let's dig a little deeper into each of these perspectives. First, some vocabulary. In psychology, a trait is defined as a relatively stable, enduring predisposition to behave in a certain way. Trait theorists accordingly view a person as having a unique combination of unique characteristics or attributes. Further, they aim to determine the extent to which a person possesses a specific trait. For instance, say someone is shy. Well, to what extent are they shy? Are they always shy? Are they shy only around people they don't know? Or are they not at all shy? Trait theorists further divide the types of traits a person has. Surface traits are personality characteristics or attributes that can be easily inferred from observable behavior. In other words, it's pretty easy to ascribe the trait of cheerfulness to someone who perpetually has a smile on their face. Source traits are the most fundamental dimensions of personality. These are the broad, basic traits that, it's hypothesized, they're universal and relatively few in number. A single source trait can potentially give rise to a vast number of surface traits. For instance, Someone who has the source trait of happiness might exhibit the surface traits of cheerfulness or friendliness or optimism or even all three. Gordon Allport was one of the founding fathers of personality psychology. While working on his PhD at Harvard University in the 1920s, he opened a dictionary and found it contained about 4,500 words that could describe personality characteristics or attributes. Such wide influence further convinced him that identifying and measuring traits could be beneficial to understanding personality. So Allport organized his list of 4,500 traits into three tiers. Cardinal, those traits which dominate and shape a person's behavior. Central, the traits that are found in some very degree in all people. And secondary, traits that are seen but only in certain situations. A contemporary of Allport's, Raymond Cattell, would develop the 16 Personality Factor Questionnaire, or 16PF, in the 1940s. Working in part from Allport's work on traits, that long list, Cattell cut down the number of traits to just 171, then used factor analysis to identify which of the 171 traits were most closely related to one another. This is how he identified the ultimately 16 key personality factors, which the 16PF seeks to define for individuals. On this screen and the next, you can see the 16 key personality factors or dimensions that Cattell identified. He lists them as a spectrum, in line with Allport's belief that it wasn't enough to identify the trait, but one also needed to identify the extent to which that trait was present in an individual. For example, look at number two. The range for intelligence clearly identifies concrete thinkers as less intelligent, while abstract thinkers are designated as more intelligent. Likewise, for number seven, the spectrum ranges from timid, someone who is presumably too hesitant or shy to interact easily with others, to venturesome, someone who enjoys being out in society. Here you can see the remaining dimensions, and you can see that it's still a spectrum. One can be anything from practical to imaginative, or relaxed to tense. A younger contemporary of Cattell's, Hans Eysenck, is known both for his work on intelligence and personality. He further refined the number of trait dimensions, but unlike Cattell, Eysenck believed there were just three. The first dimension, the spectrum between introversion and extroversion, measures the degree to which a person directs his or her energies outward toward the environment and other people, 
as opposed to inward, toward the self and self-focused experiences. An introvert is quiet, solitary, and reserved, preferring to avoid new experiences. In contrast, an extrovert is sociable and outgoing, preferring to search out stimulating environments. Now, the second dimension is the spectrum between neuroticism and emotional stability. The extent to which a person is predisposed to become emotionally upset, neurotic, or remain emotionally even, stable. Now, I think initially believe that these first two dimensions, when combined, could be used to classify people into four basic types. A person might be introverted neurotic or extroverted stable, for example. In later research, though, he would develop a third dimension, psychoticism, the extent to which a person was concerned or unconcerned about others. In 1990, one of Ising's last published papers outlined his belief that differences in personality were ultimately due to biological differences between people. On this slide, you can see the traditional four humors modified to reflect Ising's own views of the four basic types of people. Of course, by the time we get to the middle of the 20th century, there were trait psychologists who felt that 16 factors were way too many, but three certainly too few. While the first five factor theorists began promoting their idea in the 1960s, didn't actually gain traction until the 1980s. And while different five factor theorists define these factors in different ways, one way is shown on this infographic, and in this one, and in this graphic organizer. Now, while all of these views are slightly varied, they all agree that these terms can be used as shorthand for these five factors. As you can see, each of the five factors basically correspond to the social landscape to which humans have had to adapt. According to psychologists Robert Cray and Paul Costa, one benefit of the FFM, the five-factor model, is that it fits different cultures around the world. Most trait theorists believe that the big five personality traits are the basic features of the human species and that these are universal and, as I think postulated, likely biologically based. Each of these five traits enhance a human's chance of survival in any given situation. Like all trait theorists, FFM adherents believe that traits are relatively stable over time, but that some may change. An individual may, for instance, become less neurotic over the course of their lifetime or more extroverted. And while traits are generally consistent across situations, they may be constrained by social rules and expectations. For example, no matter how much an extrovert likes being the life of any gathering, they'd likely tamp down on that trait when attending a funeral. Now, given the tie between the big five factors and behavior, it is perhaps inevitable that trait psychologists are interested in behavioral genetics, which studies the effects of genes and heredity on behavior. Many trait psychologists have believed that personality was at least to some degree genetic. They noted, for instance, that the child of outgoing and sociable parents is also outgoing and sociable. Is that due to heredity? Of course, it might also be true that because her parents modeled outgoing and sociable behavior, the child learned to be outgoing and sociable, thus the need for scientific study. In 1983, 
the University of Minnesota embarked on a longitudinal study to track sets of twins born between 1936 and 1955. The original aim of the study was to track personality and interest traits between twins. In the late 1980s, new studies were added to track twins, identical or fraternal, of the same gender. Twin studies are valuable because, especially with identical twins, researchers can evaluate how two individuals sharing 100% of their genetic material and the same environment nonetheless manifest different personality traits. In 1976, researchers began looking at how identical twins raised apart and then reunited in adulthood manifested personality similarities and differences. Well, these studies are ongoing, but have revealed that there is a strong genetic evidence that extroversion and neuroticism are genetic, while the other three personality factors are potentially less so. Now, whereas the trait perspective focuses on observed behaviors, the social cognitive perspective is based around the idea that a person's conscious thought processes in different situations strongly influence his or her actions. These theorists believe that since people actively process information from their social experiences, this information then influences their goals, their expectations, their beliefs, and their behavior, as well as the specific environments they choose to inhabit. While similar in some ways to the psychoanalytic and humanistic perspectives, the social cognitive perspective relies heavily on experimental findings as opposed to self-reporting. It also emphasizes conscious, self-regulated behavior rather than unconscious mental influences and instinctual drives. Finally, it emphasizes that a person's sense of self can vary depending on the situation. This is what's called the situational sense of self. You should remember Albert Bandura, the psychologist responsible for demonstrating that not only do we as humans learn by observation, but we also learn about consequences of certain actions via observation. Observation also helps us learn about the rules and standards of behavior that apply to certain situations, as well as how other people regulate their own behavior. Bandura has proposed reciprocal determinism, the belief that human behavior and personality is caused by the interaction of behavioral, cognitive, and environmental factors. How does this work? Well, Bandura believes that every person has a self-system, a person's cognitive skills, abilities, and attitudes. It is this self-system which guides our perception and evaluation of a situation and which controls our behavior in that situation. Bandura postulated that the most critical elements of one's self-system are one's beliefs of self-esteem and self-efficacy. Now, self-esteem is a person's subjective evaluation of his or her own worth. As your text indicates, it's a pop culture myth that most people are suffering under low self-esteem. In fact, most people report moderate to high self-esteem. The benefits of high self-esteem are noted in your text. However, let's take a closer look at some of the detriments. Self-serving bias is our readiness to perceive ourselves favorably. The problem arises when a person is confronted by a situation that suggests that his or her high self-esteem is overinflated. Often, these individuals become aggressive when faced with criticism. This aggression connects to Alfred Adler's concept of the inferiority-superiority complex. An inflated self-esteem can have severe implications for everyday life. Think of it from an education point of view. When teachers or schools or coaches maintain a policy in which there is the protection of a child's self-esteem at all costs, a teacher or coach may frequently give out false praise, constant praise for doing the bare minimum. What's the problem with allowing false praise to raise self-esteem? In 1996, psychologist Roy Baumeister and his colleagues published an interdisciplinary review of literature on aggression, crime, and violence. They found that, most often, high, not low, self-esteem underlies violent behavior, 
and that the offenders turn violent when they receive feedback that contradicts their favorable images of themselves. Before you all freak out, Baumeister and his colleagues did not find that everyone with a healthy self-esteem was predisposed to violent behavior. Rather, it was those individuals who refused to lower their inflated senses of self-worth who became violent. For example, teenagers who felt they did not receive the respect they deserved were more likely to strike out than those who genuinely believed themselves unworthy. Additionally, many interviews of those incarcerated for domestic abuse or rape or murder revealed that these offenders sometimes chose a particular victim when they felt that they had been disrespected by that victim. The researchers believe that, in suggesting treatment for these violent and often sexually violent criminals, therapists should try to instill modesty and humility as a check on that high self-esteem. Then again, low self-esteem can also lead to violent and sometimes illegal behavior. For example, in a different study, it was low self-esteem that was most closely tied to delinquency and antisocial behavior. People who feel antisocial due to the perceived behavior of others might lash out violently against them. As your text indicates, stable self-esteem is fragile. Most of us will feel insecure some of the time, and some of us will struggle with feeling insecure much of the time. As you might imagine, we, often subconsciously, do various things in an attempt to protect our self-esteem. One of these things is self-handicapping, where we create a ready excuse for failure. Self-handicapping is a form of externalizing. For example, if we fear failure on an exam, we might avoid studying for it. Then, if we fail, we have a ready excuse. I failed because I didn't study. In being able to say, I failed because I didn't study, we avoid having to face questions about our competence. I failed because I didn't understand. On the other hand, if we pass the test, we can say, I passed even though I didn't study. And now, our increased self-esteem enhances our feeling of competence. I guess I just understood the material. Now back to Bandura. Self-efficacy is the degree to which a person is subjectively convinced of his or her own capabilities and effectiveness in meeting the demands of a particular situation. It was Bandura who coined the phrase self-efficacy, which he began studying in the 1970s. In his work, he argues that one's sense of self-efficacy in a particular situation helps shape our imagination of future consequences. The weaker your self-efficacy, the more dire the future consequences you imagine. That said, our sense of self-efficacy is very flexible and it influences the tasks we're willing to try and how persistent we'll be in the face of obstacles. Bandura believes that the most effective way of developing a strong sense of efficacy is through mastery experiences. Successes build a robust belief in one's efficacy. Failures undermine it. A second way is through social modeling. If we see others like ourselves succeed by sustained effort, then we might come to believe that we too have the capacity to do so. Social persuasion is a third way of strengthening people's beliefs in their self-efficacy. If people are persuaded that they have what it takes to succeed, then they exert more effort than if they harbor self-doubts and dwell on personal deficiencies when problems arise. Well, given this context, childhood is incredibly important. It is in childhood that we first begin having our mastery experiences, but developing self-efficacy is a lifelong process. By default, this means that our personality also continues to develop throughout our lives. There are other concepts critical to an understanding of the social cognitive perspective. Since SC psychologists believe that responsibility for actions lies with the individual, they emphasize personal control, the extent to which a person sees oneself as controlling or being controlled by their environment. Some people have an external locus of control, and they believe that outside forces determine their fate. Others have an internal locus, 
and believe themselves masters of their own destiny. Those tending toward the external locus often feel helpless or oppressed, both of which may then lead to resignation. We already reviewed this concept of passive resignation, what is also called learned helplessness, when we cover the unit on learning. However, an exaggerated internal locus can also be destructive, as the belief that everything is under your control and you just have to choose a course of action can lead to excessive anxiety. As your text describes, too much freedom can lead to stress due to the tyranny of choice. One's feelings of self-efficacy and personal control also affects one standing on the optimism-pessimism spectrum. Those who are more optimistic in outlook will tend to try and experience again and perhaps master the skill or behavior they were practicing. The opposite is true of those who are more pessimistic in outlook. Or is it? Psychologist Nancy Cantor and her students coined the term defensive pessimism to describe a cognitive defense mechanism in which people set low expectations for a future performance despite having done well in a similar situation in the past. Setting low expectations obviously helps to cushion the blow of possible failure. However, defensive pessimism may have a more positive effect. The strategy may be used to prepare more attentively for an upcoming situation and to predict what problems or obstacles they may face. In other words, it might lead one to over-prepare. Often, defensive pessimists may feel anxious and out of control, and this strategy of over-preparation helps them harness that anxiety as motivation with the result of a better performance. So, the good news about defensive pessimism is that it's a good strategy because it does help to manage anxiety through over-preparation. The bad news about defensive pessimism is that people who adopt it don't become more positive after more mastery experiences. In fact, because the strategy works, it may be self-perpetuating. In other words, it doesn't mask or change feelings of low self-efficacy or external locus of control. Now let's review some criticisms of these theories. Now the trait theory is often criticized because it doesn't really explain personality. It simply labels predispositions to behave in a certain way. And further, trait theorists don't attempt to explain how or why individual differences develop. Trait theory generally fails to address other important personality issues, such as basic motives that drive personality or the role of mental processes in behavior. Well, because of its focus on conscious behavior and perception, some psychologists believe that the social cognitive perspective fails to take the whole person into account, and because of its limited focus, it does not fully translate into study in the real and complex world. Now, regardless of which of the theories is your favorite, they've all come up with some sort of test to measure personality. So what are those? Well. There are numerous tests, some of which, like the 1-6-PF, have been discussed already, which help to assess personality. Now, these tests are useful only if they accurately and consistently reflect a person's characteristics on some dimension. Your text identifies and explains some of these tests. Projection tests, now, these are tests which assess personality based on a subject's response to stimuli, which are then taken as projections of personality traits. A great example of a projection test is the Rorschach ink block test, here's an example, or thematic a perception tests, where you respond to a series of pictures. Oh, other types of tests are self-report inventories, such as the very widely used Minnesota Multiphase Personality Inventory, the MMPI, and the Myers-Briggs Personality Indicator, the MBTI, which assesses personality types, not traits. Now, the Myers-Briggs is commonly used in schools. In fact, you've probably all taken this test, which looks to assess for basic categories of different dichotomies. The first dichotomy is extroversion to introversion, the second, sensing to intuition, the third, thinking to feeling, and the fourth is perceiving to judging. There are 16 possible scores on these dichotomies, and each score is considered a different personality type. For instance, an ISFP is a person who is introverted, sensing, feeling, and perceiving. 
despite its common usage, the MBTI is not a valid test. People can take the test multiple times and receive different scores each time, so it's not standardized. And despite the fact that the MBTI is sometimes used by human resources or job counselors to fill jobs, the research does not support the claim of a relationship between the MBTI and occupational success. Now, you'll all be taking a few personality tests in class soon, so you'll have the opportunity to experience tests for the different perspectives and just for fun. So, unsurprisingly, psychologists have come up with more than a handful of theories in an attempt to explain personality, how it develops, and why people act the way they do. But if you'll recall, one of the really important parts of it all was motivation. Well, that's where we're heading next in our psychology course. We'll be looking at motivation.